me through this, okay? So, because this is, in reality, you, this, this should be, you track, you're going to track every day of your life as an audio engineer, for the most part, you know what I mean? Tracking is going to become second nature. Key about tracking is you do need to understand the basic principles of tracking. You want to eliminate too much headroom, right? Because you're going you're to have a lot of noise on your tracks. The other thing you want to make sure is the reason you have to have headphones. I see so many people do this. And when people, people do this in video, it drives me nuts. They'll, they'll go out into the field and start recording something, and they won't put headphones on to check and see if there's any pops or clicks or hums. Problem is, is if you want good level, if you want to turn that stuff up and have a good solid level, you'll notice in your headphones, even if your headphones are too monitored to level, you don't hear all the buzzing. So sometimes you have to turn it up and hear, is there noise in there? You know, is there a buzzing sound? Because when you do master it, and you do finally do the mix, and you go to mastering, all of a sudden all that stuff gets enlightened, and, and you're going to go, oh crap, there's all this noise I didn't even know was there. So you have to have good level. The other thing is, what are you tracking on? Especially if you guys are at home and you're tracking on the same stuff. Like I know people that, you know, hey, I use one, inter, uh, one um, tube amp. I have a tube preamp that I use for all my stuff. Okay, that's great. Important thing about it is when you're going to use things like that, devices like a tube preamp, make sure you listen to how clean the signal is. Uh, because if you get a tube preamp that makes a lot of noise, and then you track 10 tracks on the same tube preamp, all you're doing is multiplying noise, multiplying noise, multiplying noise, to the point that it's very audible. That's really key. Walk me through the steps of recording. What does it take to get it to track? Isabel, what's step one? Uh, that's like step 10. Step one would be? Set some track. Say it again? Me. Create. Create a new track. Create a new track. Step two. How, how, what do you mean? No, you go to your, your audio. Slow. Okay. Yeah, set up input output, right? So you choose right. What did you say, Sal? Record enable. Record enable, right? What's up, Cameron? What's next? Yeah, I mean, Isabel said that, I guess. So hit record, right? Okay, there's one additional step, all right, that I want to add into that. Well, and I'll say two, really. One, before you hit record, you should listen to what is being recorded before you start. So you have to set your levels well, and you have to make sure you're hearing. Use your ear, right? It's the thing that gets lost in this whole picture, this whole process. There's a human touch to this, the element of you using your ear. All right? Use your ear, set your levels. But in order to set your levels effectively, I forgot to mention this before you guys started going. You need to go to options. Write this down. If you, do, if you already know this, great. I love Pro Tools Geniuses. You know what I mean? But if you don't know this, write it down. Because I, I don't expect you guys to verbatim remember everything. So what's an easier route? Just write the damn thing down. It's nice and easy, right? Options. Look down at the bottom. There's something called pre-fader metering. Anybody, anybody know what pre-fader metering is? Something called PFL. Anybody know what PFL is? Pre-fader level. Yeah, what does that mean? Set so your, your, your levels before you uh, start recording. Kind of, yeah. What, what it's you, in the definition. Well, that goes back what you said. You got to yeah. listen to such a level. But what, what is it? You said, what is the sample? PFL stood for what? The pre freighter level. Before, what you, before the what? Pre the what? It's in the definition. Fader. Pre fader. Okay, here's the catch. You may or may not have known this. Pro Tools architecture does not <clears throat> lend itself for you to goodness. understand this. Check this out. If I'm, <clears throat> if I'm built, okay. Cameron, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, dude, <clears throat> I'm going to give you a thousand bucks. I need you to build me a mixer channel. Just one channel. I need you to build it out of electronics. Yeah, okay, well, maybe you can't, you can't at the moment, but let's say you could. You're going to go in and you're going to build each stage of the channel strip. So the first stage is, anybody know what the first stage is? Master. Master. Yeah, what's it called? It starts with a B. Preamp. The preamp is the part that gives power to the microphone. Preamp. When you plug into the back of your device, preamp, stage one. Stage two in most uh, uh, sections, the preamp, sorry, includes high pass filter, volume knob, the game, right? But beyond that, usually that next step is EQ. Usually after that, if there is a compressor on board, yeah, compressor, great. Most of the time there's not. Most of the time it jumps right into auxiliary aux buses. And then you have a panner. And then you have a mute switch or an on-off switch. And then, last thing on the list is what? Fader. Fader. What you may or may not have known. 
unity on your fader means no difference from the game. So when you, you open up by default, you notice all your faders on your mixer, all at unity, that means they're, they're not being adjusted from the input game. <clears throat> Pre-fader listen means it excludes any volume supply to the fader. The reason why that's a big deal, the reason why that's a big deal, guys, is because <clears throat> when you're recording one track, it's so easy. This is why this is the problem with students. The problem with being a student is almost all of your demonstrated versions of you tracking include you and one track, or you and two tracks, or you and three tracks. Well, there's a little formula <coughs> for headroom. For every track that you add, you lose three dB of headroom. You guys, the live audio, remember talking about that in live? Yes. For, for every audio channel you add, you, you lose 3 dB of headroom. What that means is you add 10 tracks, you lost 30 dB of headroom. Where does the headroom come away from? The master channel. What that means is the master track, you have to create a master fader, which is why I established you guys have to create a master fader. If you don't create a master fader, there's no attenuation between all of your tracks and the output, and a lot of times it clips. And there's no way for you to even meter clipping as a combined form. So Goodness, that just brought me to a whole other thing I wanted to mention. Let's just back up and I'll just walk through this. Okay, so let's just say you're adding one track to 20 tracks that already existed. You're doing overdubs, right? 20, 20 tracks already exist, you're going to add your one track. A lot of times, all those tracks combined are much louder than your one little track. So what do you do in order to hear better in your headphones? You move the fader and you just turn it up. It's an easy fix, right? A lot of people do it. It's an easy fix. The problem with it is, is that it... If you don't have pre-fader listening or pre, I'm sorry, pre-fader metering selected, it's going to make it look like your audio is clipping, but it's only clipping after the fader. And what the way that it actually works out is the way that this thing actually works out systematically is if I were to draw the architecture that Cameron builds us for this channel strip and then include where Pro Tools falls, it does this. Input preamp. Down the channel strip on Pro Tools, it goes input preamp, inserts, known as your plugin, right? Sends, and then the DAW edit window, right? So this this is essentially, you know, uh, where it falls inside of your chain. Well, I guess in reality. No, I'm sorry. In reality, this this technically from that the editor will constitute this format, but uh, so we'll have to include this. But it does it in tracking, so that's a kind of complicated part. Crap. All right, so let me do it this way. It is different when you do a tracking versus mixing, but when you're in tracking format, insert sends, and then what you see in the editor, in the edit window of actual files. So essentially, this is hard disk recorded, which means anything you do after this point is not being affected when you record. And guess who's next? Fader. So adjusting your fader up or down while you're tracking does not change your tracking level at all whatsoever. So technically, you could pull that fader all the way down, and you'd still be able to track successfully. Let me give you an example. So do this for me. Take your track of your recording, pull your fader all the way down. And you don't have to put your headphones on for this because it'll be off. You can keep it in record table, let me have you record. In the options window, go to options. Make sure pre-fader recording is deselected, so it's not clicked. Make sure pre-fader recording is uh, metering, sorry, pre-fader metering is not selected. All right, if it's selected, just click it. All right, now go ahead and record, and watch what happens with the levels that you see. Go ahead and push record, you can talk into your mic. You're not going to hear anything, just FYI, because well, your volume is going to be your reference. Three, four, five, six, seven,
All right, let's go ahead and switch it to pre-fader metering. So essentially what happens is in the establishment of pre-fader metering, what you're seeing, what you see metered is literally a one-for-one one off the gain. The full point of this one-for-one one off the gain is to make sure that you don't clip. Now, let's talk about clipping stadiums real quick, and then I'll kind of release you guys to do your thing a little bit more. We'll talk about the next level. Clipping can happen at the condenser or the dynamic mic right at the element. How do we know how much gain a microphone can take? It's called max. Max SPL, max sound pressure level. Every microphone has a max SPL. How do we know how much volume it can take? Based on the max SPL. These can take a pretty good beating, but if you start screaming in them, they'll click at the mic. Not even at your Pro Tools rig. But notice in the gain stage, you can clip here. You can clip here. Notice, take your volume. Don't put your headphones on. Take your volume on your channel one, crank it, and start talking in that mic. You should see your clipping meter go off. A little red light. See what I'm saying? So there's your clipping meter at your interface. So that's you clipping at your interface. And on top of that, you can clip in Pro Tools if you take your fader and do instead of turning your fader all the way down, if you jack your fader all the way up. So go ahead and take your fader, set your level back to where it was naturally. Take your options and switch it back off of pre-fader metering. So go back to options, deselect de de pre-fader metering, and jack up your fader. some of those tracking features there. Now we're going to do something. Now we're going to do a little bit of tracking that is, is an interesting thought. So that should help you in some of your arts. Now, at your level, a lot of people are afraid to put things to print. And my suggestion to you is definitely start exploring and start working with live uh, plugins. And what I mean by live plugins is a set of plugins that are fixed on the post, plugins that are designed to be used on the pre before tracking actually hits the DAW. How do we do that? We have to establish a bus to use as processing. So we're going to create a bus to be our processor channel, and then we're going to create a track that it's going to send to and record to. That way we can, when we're recording on these mics, instead of just recording straight and raw, we're going to record with a little bit of EQ and a little bit of compression. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So watch how this gets done. So this, it's a pretty simple process. Leave pre-fader metering in, please. Now, if you deselected pre-fader metering, switch back to it. That way you got it. And then what we're going to do is you guys just created audio track uh, one through five before, uh, I'd say, to the left of it. So yours probably looks like, let me get rid of this. Yours probably looks like this. Select the master. Go ahead and select the master on the uh, on the nameplate so it's highlighted. Because when we add a new track, whatever track is lit up, yeah, it falls right below it. So go ahead and hit Command Shift N, and then you're gonna hit Command and down to make an aux input. We want it to be mono, right? So you're gonna make a single mono aux. Simple. Hit return. All right, let's go ahead and call that mono aux. Um, let's call this. We can call this, let's call this channel strip. All right, 
So we named it channel strip. Everybody with me so far? Yep. Okay, here's what we're gonna do. In order to make this work, we need, it's kind of like we, we're gonna have an in-between. So it's the microphone is gonna go into the aux channel, process through the processing, go out of the aux channel, be delivered to the audio channel, and then it's gonna go to the printer. So we'll have two channels in line. Essentially, it's going in one, into the other, and down into the other. In order to do that, the input of aux one needs to be your input one. So go ahead and change your, your I.O. So your input of aux one, we're going to make it input one. All right, input of aux one will be input one, not bus one. Make sure you get input, not bus. So aux one is going to be input one. The output of aux one is going to be bus one. Output of aux one is going to be bus one. So, and follow me so far? The input of your uh, VO channel that you just created, input of the VO channel will now be bus one, and the output of VO channel will be out one two. So, and let me just clearly establish this. If it's listed as an input or an output, if it's listed as an input or an output, it's either going in or out of your interface. If it's listed in the bus category, that means it's just internal routing. Okay? So that bus connection that you have from that aux channel that you just created to your new voiceover or to your old voiceover channel, that is just an internal connection, so you just map one to the other. Now in order for this to work, so this is kind of interesting. Aux channels, aux channels are always live. It's super important for you to know this. You know how, like, when I had, um, I used to work with a lot of hip-hop clients when I first started it, as an engineer, and what they would do, I loved it, it was so simple. What they would do is they would write all their keyboard parts in Pro Tools, they'd write it all in MIDI. And they'd use real, you know, they're real keyboards. They'd write it all in MIDI, they'd go program it all, they'd edit it all, time map it all, and then what they would do is they would connect all their outputs from their keyboards into the inputs of the interface, but instead of establishing them as recorded channels, they left them all as auxes. And auxes are always live. An aux channel always stays live. So if you plug you know, a left and a right into an aux channel and you say inter, uh, aux one input is interface one, two, even when you're bouncing, you know how when you bounce it blocks you out of the screen? Even when you're bouncing, if you had something patched into aux one, you can play it live while it's happening. What they would do is they'd have all the MIDI, the whole session would be just MIDI. And then what they do, they'd have the, all their uh, triggers, their beat, their MPCs, all that stuff, the drums and all that would be on these external devices. Once their MIDI was all good, what they would do is they would just hit record and take all those auxes when they were done, because they were live, you could push play and hear all those auxes play back live. The MIDI would send the keyboards and they would play at, as audio direct to the aux channel. But they would do that so they were doing that edit and they wouldn't put anything in the print until they were like, yes, we love it. Once they liked it, they create just what we're doing, do just what we're doing essentially, create new audio tracks for everything, and then they put it all in print in one final pass. And then all you'd have to do is you'd have all the stems and they're ready to go and now it's ready for mix down. Real, real simple process and I loved it because what it meant is it meant that they didn't have to, because a lot of people when they're working with their, their keyboards, a lot of times they track the keyboard in, do I like it, do I not? If I don't, then retract the keyboard in, and it's such a pain to have to watch that happen. And it's better to just put MIDI in and then you know work with the MIDI and tidy it up, and then you can put it to print. It saves a lot of time. Well, what, the way we're doing is we're doing this internal routing. What we're going to do is we're going to add, first off, you, um, here's my thought, okay? Uh, we can go ahead and use the channel strip that's in, in, uh, included in Pro Tools, just because it's kind of effectively set up in a certain uh, manner. But ideally, the goal a lot of times when you do this at home or when you do this with clients, you, a lot of times you're going to compress, all right? You're gonna, a lot of times you're going to compress, and then you're going to EQ. And the reason you'll do it in that format a lot of times in the live format is so that your EQ comes after you've leveled or sustained the level by using compression so you have more solid levels. Now the other food of thought is, or the other school of thought is to do EQ before compression. And what happens when you do EQ prior to compression is whatever you establish in the EQ, you feed that to the compressor and, and so that you're not sending the compressor anything that you don't want involved in the EQ. So a lot of times you'll do it in that format. In most, most sessions, you'll do it like that on an analog console. 
Um, what we'll do is let's open up the channel strip. So go on your aux channel, not on your VO channel. So on your aux channel, so let's say I have this set up the way you usually set up. I'm just going to map mine. Oh, whoops, wrong channel, huh? Oh, no, this is right. It's not a bus as active. Do, do, do. I have. go bus one there we go and then plug in let's go to channel strips so channel strips in the dynamic section so if you go to plug in dynamics channel strip mono now here's here's the key uh, one of the things to consider here that I don't know how often you've used first of all you you have in order to, to understand what this sounds like you have to be record enabled right well, there's two other ways to do this. If you didn't want to be record enabled, you really could, if you didn't want to be record enabled to hear what this sounds like, instead of having this bust to bus one, two, just set your output on the aux just to standard one, two, so it's live until you get it set up, and then you can bust it. Now, here's the brilliance of the way that we're doing this, though. Remember how I had you make five different channels? If you made the input of each one of those channels bus one, then what you could do is you could just use the same one aux channel strip setup that you set up and record it separately as you do your overdubs or whatever to each of these channels. So once you got this stuff set up, what you should see when you're in your channel strip is a couple things. You have your EQ, filter, dynamics, and volume. In this order right now, the effects chain is set up to go EQ before dynamics. Technically, you could rearrange this. If you open up, there's a little window right here. You could change the order of this by hitting this little drop down window right here. Uh, if you wanted to select a different format, but we'll just do the EQ filter dynamics. I'm good with that. So, what that means is, even though down here in the middle tabs where you see all this stuff happen, even though you see these in a specific order, they are still going to the EQ first, even though it's all the way down at the bottom of the screen. So, first thing I want to do to make this nice and easy is there is a, um, a filter that we want to apply. Notice it says filter one, filter two at the bottom. On the filter one, let's go ahead and take this up to 100 hertz. We're just going to roll off any additional low end. You can type in 100 if it's not hitting that for you. I'm going to go ahead and make my slope 24 dB per octave. So that's nice and rolled out. You can kind of see it visually up top here. And then, you know, I think I'm just going to give my vocal just a little bit of expressed highs. Although, I don't know why. Oh, yeah, hold on. I'm going to switch this to high shelf in my highs, this high shelf feature. How many of you are pretty familiar with EQ? Raise your hand if you're pretty confident with EQ. Okay. So maybe we need to do a little bit of a refresher with EQ. We probably should talk about that maybe Wednesday. I'm just going to get a basic EQ. Just going to give a little bit of high, a little bit of uh, mid-peak frequency here. Uh, but let's get this Q nice and tight. So kind of just establishing a basic EQ. And then once I'm done, I'm going to want to make sure on my compression, I need to talk into it to manually get this set up. So on your compression, let's go ahead and just set our compression level to 4 to 1, or the ratio, sorry, ratio to 4 to 1. You can just type in 4 if that's easier for you. We don't really know what our threshold's going to be as of yet. I would leave attack and release where they are. Go ahead and test into your mic. Once you have your ratio set up at a 4 to 1, take your microphone, start talking into it just a little. Just give it a little test one, two, and bring your threshold down. Bring your threshold down so you start seeing some gain reduction. You don't need a ton. You just need a little. So roll your threshold down until it should be to the left. Check, check, check. I'm trying to get it on the seat. Check, 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 check. Talking. 
So you're, it's hard to see. It's a little, little box. It, it says attenuation. It's off to the right of this grid. I'll come by and point it out to you. When you actually have gain reduction, you'll see a yellow light light up. Yeah. Go, ahead and roll, go ahead and roll your threshold all the way to the left. You getting that playback snap again? Yeah. Just go back in that dialog box and reset it like you did a second ago. Uh, playback engine. Check. Just Check. reset it. Check. 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 No, flip it back. Take it to like two, the 256 and then take it back to the 512. Check. 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 Just Check. cycle back and should be fine. Check. 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 Okay. So here's the thing. I went ahead and said bring your threshold all the way down so you can see it move, but that yellow bar that you see light up on the on the right hand side, you only want to live you only you only want about negative six right now. Because you don't want to kill it. So like get that kind of set to negative check, six. Check, 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 check. Check. Yeah, getting good. Okay, the other thing I would suggest, um, here's a suggestion for you. Let's all fix this real quick. All of you guys that are side addressing your microphone, square up with it. Because tonality-wise, the, the best frequencies possible, yeah, just like Cameron has this set up, the best frequencies you're going to get out of this microphone are going to be delivered at this particular angle. And, and if you just have to rotate it, or you can rotate, look how she's setting up hers, get you in there and rotate it. Yeah, and you can just rotate it. Literally, you could just take it this way and just turn the head of it. Yeah, just pull this down. Like pull it, pull it, pull it down. Down. Check, 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 check. Yeah, there you go. Now, now you got some good quality. Should be getting check. nice proximity effect. Check, 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 check. Okay, once you get once you get negative six, once you have negative six on your attenuator, go ahead and track another thirty seconds. You can just talk. For 30 seconds. Check. 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 Actually, you know what? Before you hit record, no one's hit record yet, right? No. All right. Actually, before you hit record, let me show you something about a standard workflow you're going to use for tracking. Something called takes. Anybody ever use takes in Pro Tools? No, yeah. They're called playlists to Pro Tools, but in normal studio situations, you'd call it a take. Hey, give me another take. Right? You guys heard that? What happens is, is in Pro Tools, if you were to record right over top of your the, the voiceover that you have, it doesn't de delete it. It doesn't actually throw it away. It just pulls it off the timeline. It's going to still exist in your clip list on the right. But in order for you to find it, you're going to have to manually go to the clip list and dig it out. And then put it back on the timeline in the right place. It's a pain. Easier than doing all that, we're going to create a new playlist. So hopefully... If you haven't learned how to do this, this is new stuff for you, so make sure you write this down. Little arrow right here. See this guy? It's beside if oh wait, actually here's here's a bit of a thing. Okay, you have to be at least medium size or larger in your track view. So if your track view is small or or micro or mini, you need to be at least medium. Okay, so make sure that your your track view off to the left is medium. Then you can click that little arrow next to to it. And see where it says, it, essentially that's your playlist, it says new or duplicate. You could duplicate it if you needed a duplicate as a backup, we'll, we'll use that quite a bit. But go ahead and hit new. So you're going to click on that little arrow, right, your little playlist selector. You're just going to hit new. And then it's going to say, hey, can you title this? I would title this for you guys. Go ahead and put VO with processing. Now, because you have that channel strip processing in there, once you do that, go ahead and give me 30 seconds of dialogue. Go for it. Is this supposed to take off? Yep. It takes the other track away. Yep. Basically, it's, it, it creates a new tape. That other one's going to be underneath. I'll show you how to get to it once you do this. Check. 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 Yeah, boy, I'm not going to sign up, so I'm going to check this book. I'm going to 
All right, go ahead and save that. Make sure you hit Command S so you're not uh, losing anything. Let's look at this real quick. So this is how this works out. When you make a new playlist like you just did, there's two ways to view your previous. If you go back to the arrow, you'll see your, your previous playlist should be right there above it. And you can cycle back and forth between them to audition to hear the difference. Right? Pretty cool, right? All right. The other way you could view this is over here where it says Waveform in your Track View Selector. Go to Track View Selector and pick Playlists. What this does is this actually shows, it shows both. Notice it shows one underneath. What it'll play is it'll play the one above on the top that's in the main playlist unless you hit the solo button to listen to the one down below. So you can actually toggle between them by hitting the solo on and off and hear the difference between the quality of the sounds between the two. So we're gonna get we're actually gonna do a lot with playlists because on a normal daily basis, if you're gonna be an engineer, you're gonna be using playlists like crazy. You're gonna have to find ways to manipulate playlists so that you never lose anything, you have backup versions of things, and even better, uh, what we call comping, essentially compiling uh, pieces of audio off of tapes. So if you have an artist come in and do 10 different takes, and they're like, well, I want line one out of take one, and I want line two out of take three, I want line four out of take six. You gotta know how to effectively utilize those takes and play them back and be very, very quick with showing off those takes so that you can establish one of the best versions. I'll be real with you. If, you. if you didn't know this, most of your favorite artists probably took 100 takes of the best songs that you've ever heard. Mm -hmm. And in reality, they never do it on the first take. In reality, they never keep all those previous takes. A lot of times they're piecing takes together. Why? Because if you had the tools and the resources and you knew that, you know what, if I just get the best versions of all my takes and I put them together, I'll make an easy $2 million this year. Well, you would do it, right? I mean, hell yeah. So and that's what they do. You know, they have an engineer piece, piece by piece, go piece by piece, all the way through it. There are very few artists that actually do full on takes. And in most cases, even the really good artists will do one full verse. And the chorus will be a different take. Right? So they'll do larger chunks, but they never do end to end. Why would they? You know what I mean? Counting on their voice to hold up for that one take. You know, for their career to jeopardize their career over, the, you know what I mean? That's that's a big risk to take. A lot of times, no, they're going to go through it. And a lot of times, they'll have people listen to it. The producers will check it out and go, you know what? I like this. Both takes are great. One is both takes are accurate. They're completely in tune. But one has more energy. The other one's a little more flat. You know, one has more passion. The other one's just missing a little bit. You know, one has more like. You know, vulnerability. I mean, they're looking at things like that. They're not just looking at the search. Did you hit the right notes? Did you sing the right rhythm? It's not. They're at the level where that's just more of what are we trying to get out of it? What, what kind of feel are we feeling? You know, that kind of stuff. So, all right. In closing, a couple big things to remember. Sample rate is equal to frequency. Frequency resolution. Right. Bit depth is equal to Dynamic resolution. Dynamic resolution. In terms of your, your startup sequence for Pro Tools, what's step one? Interface confirmed on. And step two? Open Pro, Open Pro Tools. Step three? It canceled. It canceled, yes. Step four? Confirm playback engine. Confirm playback engine. Step five? Confirm IO setting. Confirm IO setting. And then step six? Open yeah, open session. What was interleaved? Uh, Multiple channels into one file. Multiple channels into one file, right? Interleaved, correct? Uh, let's, oh, shuffle mode. What was the big deal about shuffle mode? If you wanted a condensed section, basically, once you take it out, it like shifts everything. Yeah, to the left. To the left. To the left in, the, in a sooner amount of time. If I'm doing music, should I be using minutes or seconds or bars and beats? Bars and beats. Bars and beats, right? Now, in my, uh, in my setup, when you guys were actually establishing your tracking for the voiceovers. What kind of level are we looking for? When you were setting your mic level up, what kind of level are we looking for? Well, that was for your gain reduction when you did compression. A, a while ago, when you first plugged your mic in and you started getting your level set up, what were we looking for? Say it again. Not clipping, but as close as we can get. 
Oh, we need a little bit of headroom. A little bit of headroom, right? We don't only need too much, right? Why was that again? That's one of the thoughts that. Yeah, but what, why wouldn't we want it too much headroom? So there's, so there's not extra noise. Yeah, so, okay, because there's not, so there's not extra noise, because the combination of multiple tracks with extra noise. Yeah, essentially it adds noise in the end, right? How many dB do we lose per each live track? Three. Three. We kind of just touched on that a little bit. In terms of the um, the, the tools that we used, uh, tell me about one of the tools that you learned about today. Uh, the zoom in the uh, other zoom tools. Oh, the zoom. Okay, some of the, the zoom toggle tools, right? Uh, well, that zoom toggle one was an interesting one. So the the the, 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 the option to use the wheel to zoom. Oh yeah, option use the wheel to zoom, which is internal zoom. Hopefully you had that key down. What's that? Oh, uh, panning, uh, the pencil tool. The difference between utilizing a straight pencil tool with a straight line or freehand. Triangle, and we'll use the other one. One more. Square? Square. Square, right? Makes sense? Coming together? Uh, let's see, what else did we do tool wise? Oh, we did uh, trim reversal. What's the trim reversal tool? Uh, if it's uh, trim tool this way, it'll chop up everything that way. What was the hotkey for it? Option. Option, right? Uh, and I think there was one more that we did. Oh, we did the grabber tool. What, when I, when grabber tool is selected in object, what did it do? Say again. Yeah, it'll move it. What did it do that was specific about, different about normal grabber versus grabber in the object? It moves, it moves only, what's, only what's highlighted. Yeah, but what was specific about what was highlighted? They were separated. Yes. Yeah. yeah, they were, they were non-contiguous, what we call non-contiguous. Right? They weren't touching each other. Uh, I'm trying to think there was a, uh, shoot, what else did we do? We did trim focus. Oh, what was tab to transient? Not camera, because he answered this question earlier. Tab to transients? Yeah, it goes to the next transient. Uh, and what was this uh, uh, playback? Where was it? It was, uh, do, do, do. is it this one? Oh yeah, link track and edit selection. What did that do? Where it, uh, it would only play the the section that you had edited previously, right? This one was the one that when you selected it, it took it it highlighted all the nameplates on the oh, left. Okay. All right, we're gonna go ahead and tear this thing down. Let's go ahead and uh, pack it up. Homework is reading chapter one. I will require you to have a one page bullet point. Report about channel uh, chapter one on Wednesday. So on Wednesday, it just could be a one pager. It's as easy as going, okay, chapter one, here's the heading. Here's the subheadings. Here, here's what was in the subheadings and how to do them. Oh, basically like an outline. Yeah, I mean, except for the fact that it's not all just topical stuff. Inside of the topics, you need to be telling me how you would do it. If it's talking about, you know, uh, tracking uh, a mic. Here's step one, step two, step three. I would bullet point that stuff because it's going to be useful for you. So, so try to write it in a way that's easily shorthanded for you. I don't need paragraphs because they're hard for you to pick out the specific information. What I want are easy bullet points or numbered, numbered points. So you don't want to turn anything in No, no, you're, uh, you're oh, not. Save, save this. Uh, we'll, no, we so won't go back to it, but you can save it. Uh, no, you can just save it to your, your hard drive. Yeah, you can just save it to your hard drive. But, um, big thing is each day we're going to be doing these dailies. I don't need them because I saw you do them, um, at least for this one. But on certain days, I will ask for you to submit your stuff. I am going to put the video again on the share drive. So on Wednesday, if you, if you miss anything, if you want to copy anything from today, then you can just get it from the share drive from, from what we did today in class. Back up your gear. I'll go ahead and take it back. I don't mind if you could just do me a favor and stack it up right here. Uh, William, your mic stand was the one that was already here, yes, so you can leave it here with, you can leave the clip on it. But go ahead and leave your mics, your cables, all that stuff here. You guys did good today. Very good, very good start.